he flew out of the car. He got kind of banged up a little bit, and and you know they obviously took him to the hospital and checked him out to make sure that he was okay. But he was he was okay. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't look like something like that would would be okay. Because wow, he's flying through the air. <laughs> I'm Jim Valgarino, and we are located at the former Tunis Speedway in Waterloo, Iowa. This speedway closed uh, back in 1983. It obviously is no longer in existence, as you can see by the, uh, the landscape that we have surrounding us. I grew up in this town. I've been around cars virtually my whole life. I'm a race fan, all those kind of things. This racetrack played a, 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 a role in the history of this area. In 1906, 10-year-old Judd Tunis was running around Waterloo working for a meat cutting uh, company as a delivery boy. And he had to do all this very quickly. That was a uh, one of those on-demand businesses that they needed to get things out to people right away and so that's what Judd began doing and so he had to run around on bicycles and run wherever it is that he had to go and he was dodging cars in the streets of Waterloo which at that time were all dirt streets but a lot of those cars were actually built here uh, the Maytag Mason, the Galloway, the Duryea motor wagon all of those things were built actually in Waterloo inside of uh, Waterloo's uh, burgeoning industrial complex. Judd was a very ambitious kid and he really enjoyed the whole idea of uh, the meat cutting business. And eventually that is what he made his career of, his meat cutting. As John Deere and obviously Rath Packing Company grew, and many more workers began to flood into this area. Um, this was soon after uh, World War II. And so the customer base was there and he had an opportunity to, to uh, really take advantage of that. He married in 1917. Marie was uh, someone that he actually had uh, come across at a parade in downtown Waterloo. And they continued to work at getting this company uh, really successful. And at one time, Judd Tunis had uh, several locations throughout the city. He was pretty ambitious. In 1941, he decided that he wanted to buy uh, land on the southwest side of Waterloo. And there was about 52 acres available. And so he went ahead and did it. One of the things that Judd really enjoyed were horses. He was into more of the quarter horses and, and the, uh, really the, uh, the breeds that were used for uh, trotting races and that type of thing. And what he wanted to do was board horses and train them. Over time, uh, Judd decided that he didn't really like the fact that he had to take his horses and put them in a trailer and, and haul them all the way up to Waverly where he was uh, able to exercise his horses and he got the idea that well I've got enough room I'm gonna build myself a track so he built a horse track and again this is wasn't an unusual thing around that time uh, there were horse tracks uh, that surrounded this area a lot of them were attached to county fairs and, and that type of thing um, but he thought he could just have his own so he built a half mile horse track he put up grandstands, he staged some races, and what he found was it didn't bring the crowds that he was kind of uh, intending to have. That was, that was part of uh, what he really wanted to do was to uh, have a kind of an entertainment venue. So he built a separate track inside the half mile, and he spent nearly $50,000 to have that track excavated. Uh, he had uh, dirt brought in so that he could build up the banking and do all that type of thing. He built the concession stands. He put up much larger grandstands. I mean, he went all out uh, to try and get the right facility in place. There was only one thing that was a little bit probably odd about this effort. 
there were no race car drivers in this area. Initially, the, the track did stage a couple of uh, midget car races, but the, the car drivers weren't from around this area. So, in Waterloo, Iowa, there was a, a gentleman named Ira Speed Chumley. He owned a used car lot in Waterloo. He happened to have some background in midget car racing. He eventually uh, got a hold of Judd and said, you know, what you really need to do is you need to have full size car races. We can get that to, to work. I, I think we can, we can actually put together uh, a group of people that will have cars and they'll come out and they'll race. And that's exactly what he did. And one of the things that Judd had uh, done was made an agreement with the local Blackhawk Motorcycle Club to uh, help in the construction of the uh, grandstands. And it was a big job. And there were probably 30 or 40 uh, motorcycle members who came out and part of their agreement was, once this track is built, we want to be able to race on it. So Judd said, that sounds good. Let's, let's get that done. So some of the very early races in 1948, 1949 were motorcycle races. A lot of those uh, people came from the motorcycle clubs that were local. A lot of those guys were more than happy to take the risk and go buy a car for $35 and bring it over here, take the hubcaps off, and they were racing. Over that next two year period, the ranks of drivers grew uh, very quickly. In the early 50s, they built a uh, racing association that had upwards of 100 drivers. They came from all over this area, uh, not only within Blackhawk County, and there were a lot of people that were just very interested in, in doing that type of competition. And in talking to a lot of those drivers, uh, one of the things that they, almost every one of them said uh, over and over was, how did you get started doing this? And they'd say, I came out here with my friends and my buddies and we were sitting in the stands and we looked at that and thought, well, we could do that. And inevitably they would go buy a, a car somewhere for $50 or whatever it was that it took. And the next week they were out racing. As the group of drivers grew, um, many of them became actually very good at what they were doing and the, and the, the entire uh, process became a lot more organized, a lot more professional. Instead of just people bringing out jalopies basically and running around a track and running into each other and, and, and not really uh, being very safe, the drivers actually uh, came together, uh, had an association, came up with rules and guidelines and there were all kinds of things that they had to uh, create so that they could actually do this and uh, not kill anyone. <laughs> the other thing that happened in conjunction with this was obviously you started having a lot more spectators. This was one of the few tracks in the Midwest that was first uh, privately owned and it would draw anywhere from three to 5,000 spectators every week to the races. Obviously with something like that, there's a lot of things that have to happen. So Judd found himself uh, developing parking areas and having volunteers and having uh, hot dogs and popcorn. And, you know, he had to be able to keep these spectators really excited about coming every week. Most of those spectators now, when you talk to a lot of those families, they remember well coming in to the track and it came in on, on two sides basically. And uh, they would come in and either they would sit up in the stands or there's actually a hill that sits up over that direction on the back side of what was then turn two. And it was just a grassy hill and they would come in and bring a blanket and a picnic and they'd come in on Sunday afternoon and they'd watch the cars uh, doing their hot laps and then stay obviously for the evening. It was all just a very big community that was built around that whole event. Obviously within uh, the racing community, there was an expectation that there were gonna be accidents. Uh, whether they were intentional accidents or they were accident accidents, 
uh, th they happen quite often. And obviously the audience uh, that was there was always intrigued by those uh, things that happened on the track, whether a car flipped over, uh, went off the track, crashed into another car, whatever it might be. Sometimes those were intentional. I talked to a driver that uh, actually raced in one of the very, very first races. He was a motorcycle rider and he had started racing because his buddies had said, you know, anybody could be able to do that. So he, he began racing. Um, he said he never was really good at it, but he said one of the things that he did a lot was he flipped over, a lot. He said almost every race he would turn the car over. There was a restaurant in town called Chicken on Wheels, and Chicken on Wheels would uh, award a, a chicken dinner to any driver that flipped over. So a lot of drivers, if they weren't gonna win, thought, well, I want a chicken dinner. And they would just flip over. And this gentleman was exactly that way. He would think, well, I'm not gonna get anywhere, so I think I'm just gonna go ahead and flip the car over. I asked him if he ever was actually hurt, and he said, well, a couple times I, I flipped and I, I did it a little bit harder than what I expected. And so the car would go end over end or whatever. Keep in mind that these People were not inside of a cage or, in a lot of cases, didn't even wear helmets. They could get banged up pretty good. But he said one time he did it and he ran off the track, the car flipped over, uh, they came and, and drug him out and he was unconscious at that moment. And he said he had no idea what was happening. And he said he kind of stumbled around for a while, but he said after a while I was, I was fine. Nothing more actually happened from that. But one thing he did get from that was his nickname, and it still is today, and he's in his 90s, is Flip Piper. The announcer that was announcing the races after a while would just say, and now coming onto the track is Flip Piper. Moving into, uh, through the 1960s, the cars were uh, beginning to go faster, the drivers were finding that they could race at other venues around the area. Uh, in some cases, they could make more money at other tracks, and Judd was very aware of that, and he had to be uh, very determined to try and make certain that this track was always the premier track that they could go to. So the purses had to get bigger, so the drivers could actually make more money. Um, they had to uh, do it in such a way that they could afford, first off, to actually build a car. And in some cases, they had sponsors that would uh, actually take a car, build it, and then have a driver come in and drive it for them. Um, and there were quite a number of drivers that made a living uh, doing just that. And there were a number of drivers that were in this area that grew out of this whole effort that uh, eventually became regional winners. Uh, some of them traveled as far away as Florida to race. Some people would come in from out of state and, and race in this area and know that this was one of the places where you were gonna race against some really good racers. At some point in the uh, early 1970s, he could see that there was a certain amount of development that was beginning to happen on this side of Waterloo. The highway that this was located on, Highway 218, had been changed to a four lane and it was renamed University Avenue. Racing was really taken off and, and so there was a lot of uh, drivers that were finding that they could go to other places uh, get sponsors, uh, there was more money in it. I mean, there were all kinds of things that were happening. The sport just became so much more professional and it cost more money and it just got to the point where it became harder and harder for these drivers to be able to afford to continue to do this. In 1979, Judd, came to the conclusion that he was just getting tired. He was in his early 80s. He had put in some over 30 years of uh, promoting uh, racing on his property. He had done a great job in all of its 35-year history from 1948 to uh, 
1983. This track never had a death ever that was related to an actual uh, racing incident. But he decided that it was it was enough. He just couldn't, you know, uh, take on any more uh, maintenance and the upkeep and all the things that had to go on to keep this track really uh, at a level that it needed to be. In 1983, the track ran its last race. It was a 250 lap uh, race. It was a long race, but it was the last one. One of the aspects of this history is that all of these images and stories are coming from just regular people. For 35 years, this was an important part of a lot of people's lives. Whether it was a family member or somebody that had kept their grandfather's scrapbook or a, a, a shoebox full of pictures, whatever it might be, that's, that was that history. Is that important to Waterloo? Sure, every city I think has uh, a story and this is just one of the stories. Thank you.